Good morning, boys and girls. Today we are going to be reading The Witches, written by Roald Dahl and illustrated by Quentin Blank. Yesterday we read the chapter about a note about witches. And remember, any woman could be a witch, so you need to be on the lookout. Today our chapter is called My Grandmother. I had two separate encounters with witches before I was eight years old. From the first escape, unharmed, but on the second occasion, I was not so lucky. Things happened to me that will probably make you scream when you read about them. They can't be helped. The truth, the truth must be told. The fact that I am still here and able to speak to you, however peculiar I look, is due entirely to my wonderful grandmother. My grandmother was Norwegian. The Norwegians know all about witches, for Norway with its black forests and its icy mountains is where the first witches came from. My father and my mother were also Norwegian, but because my father had a business in England, I, ha I had been born there and had lived there and had started going to an English school. Twice a year at Christmas and in the summer, we went back to Norway to visit my grandmother. This old lady, as far as I could gather, was just about the only surviving relative we had on either side of our family. She was my mother's mother, and I absolutely adored her. When she and I were together, we spoke in either Norwegian or in English. It didn't matter which. We were equally fluent in both languages. And I have to admit that I felt closer to her than to my own mother. Soon after my seventh birthday, my parents took me as usual to spend Christmas with my grandmother in Norway. And it was over there while my father and mother and I were driving in icy weather just north of Oslo that our car skidded off the road and went tumbling down into a rocky ravine. My parents were killed. I was firmly strapped into the back seat and I received only a cut on my forehead. I won't go into the horrors of that terrible afternoon. I still get the shivers when I think about it. I finished up, of course, back in my grandmother's house with her arms around me tight and both of us crying the whole night long. What are we going to do now? I asked her through the tears. You will stay here with me, she said, and I will look after you. Aren't we going back to England? No, she said. I could never do that. Heaven's sakes shall take my soul, but Norway will keep my bones. The very next day, in order that we might both try to forget our great sadness, my grandmother started telling me stories. She was, what, she was a wonderful storyteller, and I was enthralled by everything she told me, but I didn't become really excited until she got on to the subject of witches. She was apparently a great expert on these creatures, and she made it very clear to me that her witch stories, unlike most of the others, were not imaginary tales. They were all true. They were the gospel truth. They were history. Everything she was telling me about witches had actually happened, and I had better believe it. What was worse, what was far, far worse, was that the witches were still with us. They were all around us, and I had better believe that too. Are you really being truthful, Grandmama? Really and truly truthful, I asked. My darling, she said, you won't last long in this world if you don't know how to spot a witch when you see one. But when you told me that witches look like ordinary women, Grandmama, how, so how can I spot them? You must listen to me, my grandmother said. You must remember everything I tell you. After all, all you can do is cross your heart and pray to heaven and hope for the best. We were in the big living room of her house in Oslo and I was ready for bed. The curtains were never drawn in that house, and through the windows I could see huge snowflakes falling slowly to an outside world that was as black as tar. My grandmother was tremendously old and wrinkled, with a massive wide body which was smothered in late gray lace. She sat there majestic in her armchair, filling every inch of it. Not even a mouse could have squeezed it into, squeezed in to sit beside her. I, myself, just seven years old, was crutched on the floor at her feet, wearing pajamas, a dressing gown, and slippers. You swear you aren't pulling my leg, I kept saying to her. You swear you aren't just pretending. Listen, she said, I have known no less than five children who have simply vanished off the face of this earth, never to be seen again. The witches took them. 
I still think you're just trying to frighten me, I said. I am trying to make sure you don't go the same way, she said. I love you and I want you to stay with me. Tell me about the children who disappeared, I said. My grandmother was the only grandmother I ever knew who smoked cigars. She lit one now, a long black cigar that smelt of burning rubber. The first child I knew to disappear, she said, was called Ringhald Hansen. Ringhald was about eight years old at the time and she was playing with her little sister on the lawn. Their mother, who was baking bread in the kitchen, came outside for a breath of air. Where's Ringwald, she asked. She went away with the tall lady, the, the little sister said. What tall lady, the mother asked. The tall lady in white gloves, the little sister said. She took Ringwald by the hand and led her away. No one, my grandmother said, ever saw Ringwald again. Did they go and search for her, I asked. They searched for miles around. Everyone in the town helped and they never found her. What happened to the other four children, I asked. They vanished, just as Ringhall did. But how, Grandmama, how did they vanish? In every case, a strange lady was seen outside the house just before it happened. But how did they vanish, I asked. The second one was very peculiar, my grandmother said. There was a family called Christensen. They lived up on Holen Colon, and they had an oil painting in the living room, which they were very proud of. The painting showed some ducks in the yard outside a farmhouse. There were no people in the painting, just a flock of ducks on a grassy farmyard and the farmhouse in the background. It was a large painting and rather pretty. Well, one day their daughter Solveig came home from school eating an apple. She said a nice lady had given it to her on the street. The next morning, little Solveig was not in her bed. The parents searched everywhere, but they couldn't find her. Then all of a sudden, her father shouted, There she is! That's Solveig feeding the ducks! He was pointing at the oil painting, and sure enough, Solveig was in it. She was standing in the farmyard in the act of throwing bread to the ducks out of a basket. The father rushed up to the painting and touched her, but that didn't help. She was simply a part of the painting, just a picture painted on the canvas. Did you ever see that painting, Grandmama, with the little girl in it? I asked. Many times, my grandmother said, and the peculiar thing was that little Solveig kept changing her position in the picture. One day she would actually be inside the farmhouse and you could see her face looking out of the window. Another day she would be far off to the left with a duck in her arms. Did you see her moving in the picture, Grandmama? Nobody ever did. Wherever she was, whether outside feeding the ducks or inside looking out of the window, she was always motionless. Just a figure painted in oils. It was all very odd, my grandmother said. Very odd indeed. And what was most odd of all was that as the years went by, she kept growing older in the picture. In 10 years, the small girl had become a young woman. In 30 years, she was middle-aged. Then all at once, 54 years after it all happened, she disappeared from the picture altogether. You mean she died, I asked. Who knows, my grandmother said. Some very mysterious things go on in the world of witches. That's two you've told me about, I said. What happened to the third one, I asked. The third one was little Bridget Svensson, my grandmother said. She lived across the road from us. One day she started growing feathers all over her body. Within a month, she had turned into a large white chicken. Her parents kept her for years in a pen in the garden. She even laid eggs. What color eggs, I asked. Brown ones, my grandmother said. Biggest eggs I've ever seen in my life. Her mother made omelets out of them. Delicious they were. I gazed up at my grandmother who sat there like some ancient queen on her throne. Her eyes were misty gray and they seemed to be looking at something many miles away. The cigar was the only real thing about her at that moment, and the smoke it billowed around her head in blue clouds. But the little girl who became a chicken didn't disappear, I asked. No, not Bridget. She lived on for many years laying her brown eggs. You said all of them disappeared. Oh, I made a mistake, my grandmother said. I'm getting old. I can't remember everything. What happened to the fourth child, I asked. The fourth child was a boy called Harold, my grandmother said. 
One morning, his skin went all grayish yellow. Then it became hard and crackly, like the shell of a nut. By evening, the boy had turned to stone. Stone? I asked. You mean real stone? Granite, she said. I'll take you to see him if you'd like. They still keep him in the house. He stands in the hall, a little stone statue. Visitors lean their umbrellas up against him. Although I was very young, I was not prepared to believe anything my grandmother had told me. And yet, she spoke with such conviction, with such utter seriousness, and with never a smile on her face or a wrinkle in her eye, that I found myself beginning to wonder. Go on, Grandmama, I said. You told me there were five altogether. What happened to the last one? Would you like a puff of my cigar, she said. Oh, I've only seven, Grandmama. I don't care what age you are, she said. You'll never catch a cold if you smoke cigars. What about number five, Grandmama, I asked. Number five, she said, chewing the end of her cigar as though it was a delicious asparagus, was rather an interesting case. A nine-year-old boy called Leaf was summer holidaying with his family on the forge, and the whole family was picnicking and swimming off some rocks on one of those little islands. Young Leaf dived into the water, and his father, who was watching him, noticed that he stayed under for an unusually long time. When he came to the surface at last, he wasn't Leaf anymore. What was he, Grandmama? I asked. He was a porpoise, a dolphin, she said. He wasn't. He couldn't have been. Oh, he was a lovely young porpoise, she said, as friendly as could be. Oh, Grandmama, I said. Yes, my darling. Did he really and truly turn into a porpoise? Absolutely, she said. I knew his mother well. She told me all about it. She told me how Leaf the porpoise stayed with them all that afternoon, giving his brothers and sisters rides on his back. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me. They had a wonderful time. Then she waved a flipper at them and swam away, never to be seen again. But Grandmama, I said, how did they know that the porpoise was actually Leaf? They talked to him, my grandmother said. He laughed and joked with them all the time he was giving them rides. But wasn't there a most tremendous fuss when this happened, I asked? Not much, my grandmother said. You must remember that here in Norway, we are used to that sort of thing. There are witches everywhere. There's probably one living in our street this very moment. It's time for you to go to bed. A witch wouldn't come in through my window at night at the night time, would she? I asked, quaking a little. No, my grandmother said. A witch will never do silly things like climbing up drains or breaking into people's houses. You'll be quite safe in your bed. Come along. I will tuck you in. So we have five we grandma knows five children who have disappeared because of the witches. And the boy who is telling the story, he's starting to believe everything his grandmother tells him. Tomorrow, for our next chapter, we have the chapter called How to Recognize a Witch. Please stay tuned. Thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a wonderful day, boys and girls.